hot mic this for you. Okay. Are we ready at one? We're ready. Um, I'll get you some more. Therefore, since we're surrounded, look around, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of pro-life witnesses, let us persevere in running this race set before us with our eyes fixed on you, Lord. Amen? Amen? Who believes that? Amen? Amen. Come on, amen? Amen. Yeah! Let's act like survivors. A survivor has gratitude. A survivor has, feels a sense of responsibility. Every one of you are survivors. Survivors of abortion. And for perspective, if you think that that's a stretch or extreme, one, two, three, four, five. What's your name? Jaden. Jaden. One out of five conceptions in our country are aborted. Who knows Jaden? Anyone know Jaden here? Yeah, make it personal, everyone. What if Jaden's mom aborted him? Legal right. And of course, just because it's legal doesn't make it right. We've all had a little bit of history by this point as high school students. Slavery. The irony that the 13th and 14th Amendments that gave personhood to all people don't apply to people in the womb, as Deacon Tim was alluding to. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Your students, let's go through the ologies. How about biology? I'll go ahead and speak on behalf of science. I'm a PhD nanoanalytical chemist. 
I taught biochemistry at the Air Force Academy for seven years. Taught chemistry at a, the largest public high school in Missouri for two years. Taught at a private college in Missouri called William Woods. Life begins at conception. Fact. There's the biology. If we had a picture of your first cell, the zygote, who's had a little biology in here? Anyone had some biology yet? Raise your hand if you had biology. Yeah, that first cell, zygote, your first cell, if we took a picture of that microscopic image, that'd be your first baby photo. Oh, look how cute you'd look. <laughs> and if you want to know what you look like, something like, oh, look how cute you look. There, can't you see? There you are. That's you. Full human genome, full DNA. The only difference between you at that point, your first cell and now, time, food. You're still changing. You change the next moment, you're changing now. If I gave you a photo of you, you live to be 100, take your 100-year-old picture and compare your 100-year-old picture to your photo right now, think you're going to look the same? Probably not even recognizable. Might not even know that it's the same person. How about you now and your, do you look the same? Mm-mm. Still you, still you. That 100-year-old picture, still you. So biology. How about theology? Anyone know what Jeremiah 1.5 says? We're just getting through all the school stuff before we get to the, the activism and cool stuff. Let's get through the school stuff. The theology. Father, you went through the seminary, so theology, <laughs> you're wearing it, you're wearing your degree. With your ordination, thank you for being a priest. And Father, isn't it interesting how our, our body, the zygote, looks a whole lot like something that we recognize at Mass. The body of Christ looks like, that, like a communion host. I always found that super interesting that the body of Christ, that communion host, looks a whole lot like a zygote. And how people will question, Father, whether that's human life. They question that, as we know, surrounding this issue, like when does life begin at conception? And they question the reality of Jesus' body. That's fully Jesus. That's our faith. And that's the truth. But how interesting... And even the chrono radiata around that zygote father, kind of like a little mini monstrance. Of course you were. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for being a priest, Father. So Jeremiah 1.5, the theology of this. What does God have to say? God makes it even simpler than talking about biology. Check this out. He goes before the biology. He says, oh, let me make it simple for you in Jeremiah 1.5. I knew you even before you were in your mother's womb. That's what Jeremiah 1.5 is. Whoa! So our spiritual identity. We were conceived spiritually even before we were conceived physically. Whoa! That's pretty cool! There's the theology. How about a little political science? How about a little political science? What's the first duty of government, everybody? What's the first duty, the top thing, the number one thing that a government, why we have government? Anyone want to take a stab at it? First duty of government. Teachers, you can jump in too if you want to. Just like, hey, I want to take a crack at this. The first duty of government is what? I'm glad it came. <laughs> <laughs> to protect the people. To protect the people. That is the first duty of government. And we're getting a giant F for the first duty of government. We're getting a giant F with our own government. Why? Because of what Deacon Tim shared. We're over 63 million American citizens have died in the womb. Under a law that legalized that. That's not protecting the people. That averages out at about 1.2 million a year since 22 January 1973. For perspective, of all combat casualties in the history of our country. So combat, fighting for freedom, for us to be American and free, right? To protect the people, combat. Total of all combat casualties 
since the Revolutionary War, 750,000 casualties. This year alone, we're on pace for 850,000 abortions. So in one year of abortion, more loss of life than all combat casualties in the history of our country. How's this for school today, everybody? They're not getting this at public school. You're not even getting it on Google. If you were to Google right now, leading cause of death in America, this is what you're going to find. You can do this after, like, I hope you're like, oh, I'm going to go check that. Check all of it. And oh, by the way, please invite your parents to come tonight at 6.30. They're going to get some of what you got and even more. Okay? You're like, hey, you got to come and hear this guy. He shared stuff I didn't know about. Invite him to come, 6.30, right here in the gym. But what Google says, if you, if you Google leading cause of death in America, this is what Google's going to tell you. 600,000 Americans are going to die this year to heart disease. And then secondly, it's going to say 530,000 Americans are going to die to cancer. It's not going to have the information I just shared with you. It is not going to have 850,000, that's the pace we're at, are going to die to abortion. And what's so weird about that is those numbers, you might be thinking, like, hey, where'd those numbers come from? I hear you. Those numbers come from gov contracted government services, the Guttmacher Institute. They're their numbers. I mean, we're in school, right? So we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to talk truth. What does scientists do? A scientist is a truth seeker. What does a Christian do? Proclaim the truth. Why do you come to school? To learn the truth. Let's start with school. So we made it through political science. What's left? How about philosophy? How about philosophy? What's the first premise of philosophy? First, do no harm. Whoa! We get an F in philosophy. Even if someone wasn't sure when life began, philosophy says, don't act. This is the common thing we learn in philosophy that you're out hunting and you see something... Any hunters? Pheasant hunter. Philosophy says you're out deer hunting and you see something moving around in the bush. You don't go like, hey, there might be a deer in there and pull the trigger off. And it's horrifying to say this. But of course, adults, we know that every year, loved ones are shot and killed on deer and elk hunts because someone pulled the trigger on what they thought was a deer. When in doubt, don't act. First, do no harm. So we're making our way through school, right? And if we're in a government class right now and you're wondering what our founding fathers had to say on this, well, guess what? This banner up here, on Friday, this past Friday, so five days ago, Bernadette, raise your hand. Bernadette and I and 150,000 other people that decided to march for life, we walked through Washington, D.C. From the Washington Monument, the monument to our founding father, our first president, to the Supreme Court, whose job is to uphold justice. There's nothing just about abortion. And it certainly is in line with our founding fathers. How can I prove that? Walk around D.C. Who's been to Washington, D.C.? Who's been to Washington, D.C.? Walk around, read the monuments. The new one I tagged, I've probably been there a dozen times, but the monument that's kind of out of the way for those that have been there is the Thomas Jefferson. It's just kind of, it's off the Washington Mall. It's, Father, you've been there? It's a little out of the way. It's like, you know what, we're going to do it. We're going to the Thomas, and I'm glad I did. You remember, Bernadette, when we walked in there and we looked up, and those giant letters in, inscribed in the Thomas Jefferson Memorial? Here's the top line. God who gave us life gave us liberty. God gave us life. God gave us freedom and free choice. And that's what we, as Americans, stand for. That's what our Constitution stands for. Even the 13th and the 14th Amendment now stand for that, after we undid the unjust 
notion of enslaving people. We got it right. We fixed it. But how weird that those same two amendments are being used to uphold abortion. I kid you not. I'll give you the weird and the good news update on pro-life in our country. The good news is I listened to the two hours of argument on December 1st when the latest challenge to abortion, Roe v. Wade, happened under Dobbs versus Jackson. Anyone listen to any of that? Any snippets? Anybody raise your hand if you listen to these snippets or read some articles on it. When you listen to the, the arguments and listen to all the Supreme Court justices, I'll tell you what, folks, I'm very hopeful. So you, you heard it here. I think it's going to go 6-3. I don't think it's going to go 5-4. I think it's going 6-3. I think John Roberts is even going to vote to overturn Roe. Why? If nothing else, I think they just want to rid their hands of it and push that from the federal level that abortion is legal through all 40 weeks of pregnancy, if you didn't know that, and push it to the states. And when that happens this summer, because most major Supreme Court decisions, they happen about six months later after the arguments. So it could be sometime in June when that happens. Guess what's going to happen in Nebraska that same day? Abortion is going to be illegal. Pretty cool, huh? A little bit more Nebraska pro-life history for everybody, because we're still in school. Nebraska was the first state to go to challenge the law of the land, which in 1992 and Casey versus Planned Parenthood said, yeah, the state's interests really begin in the third trimester. So after 24 weeks. Before that, states can't really challenge the first two trimesters, so up to 24 weeks. And they kind of defined it based on viability, when a child could live outside the womb. And of course, the nonsense from philosophy, you give me a two-year-old that if we dropped them off five miles outside of town, on a winter day, you think they're going to make it, the two-year-old? No. They're going to freeze to death. Viability? How relative. But that was the law of land when life would be protected. So Nebraska was the first state that challenged that and just kind of did a, I'm going to call your bluff, Supreme Court. And we moved it from 24 down to 20 weeks. And that was in the early 90s. And then many states followed Nebraska. But that's just a little bit so you know what your roots are. You could make an argument that you're in the most pro-life state in America. Because of the law of the land and the state laws. And that's to be proud of. Because that's who you are as someone that was born in Nebraska. And that's who you are, which is in line as being a true American. There is nothing patriotic about abortion. There is nothing American about abortion, per the little lesson that we just went through. Political science, philosophy, biology, theology. Be proud of that legacy. Be proud of the legacy that, keep praying, that the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, that on that same day, abortion will be illegal in Nebraska. In about 2021, 22 other states is the estimate. On that day, the same thing will happen. There's trigger laws. So it'll be pushing about half the states. And doesn't this sound like another stage in American history? Slavery? When you had slave states and not slave states, and you've probably studied some of that and seen, seen the map, then the next battle begins. And then you'll see people moving to places like Nebraska, because it'll become more apparent that we get it. <laughs> this is what it means to be American. That God who gave us life gave us liberty. And people might even move states. We'll see this in your lifetime. And then hopefully, at some point, the Supreme Court will go from, oh, we're just not going to deal with it, to intervening. Hopefully Congress at some point will take it to the finish line. Just like the 13th and 14th Amendment. And go, oh, let's make this right. Unborn children are people. That's what science says. That's what philosophy says. 
That's what God says. Isn't it wild that the most dangerous place on the planet is the womb of a mother? By the numbers? Isn't that wild? It's not the highway. It's not the new driver. It's not cancer. It's just, it's unfathomable. We want to get to where abortion isn't just illegal, but we want to get back to where you go, what? And guess who gets it best, everybody? The kindergartner. You were there. Who was there at the K through three and the three through five? Raise your hand, Deacon Tim. You were there. Those little people get it. They relate like, hey, that was me. The, the little kid that was there just a few years ago in their mother's room like, hey, I was just there a couple, three years ago or four years for the toddler. You know, they, they really get it. They get it better than these PhD scientists. And how does that happen if they're so smart? You remember that Satan works with two things. Fear and pride. Those are Satan's top of the stack portals of diabolic to separate us. And so what does Satan do? Which one does he use with these smarty pant scientists that don't believe in God? What a weird deal for me. I mean, the awe and wonder of creation for me as a scientist, I'm like, whoa, obviously there's a creator. And God is so cool. So how do these other scientists lose that? It's weird. But let me take a crack at it. They were like you in a science class and reading about biochemistry or DNA, seeing how the atmosphere works, seeing how the cells work, Realizing that every cell is like its own little power plant generating energy. And they were like, whoa, that is awesome. Wow, God. And somewhere along the way, as they started doing their own research and breaking down God's creation, putting together, writing a paper about it, and then going, they moved from, wow, look what God did, to, wow, look what I did. And that's pride. And they slowly step away from God until they don't even recognize Him. And then they, the ones that actually know how the biochemistry comes together and the awe and wonder, and could even explain it to you, they don't even recognize themselves or others in that zygote. And then before you know it, as they step away, they don't even recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And they are on the road to hell. For real. And it takes people who love God and love neighbor to meet them where they're at. Hey, I want to show you something. Hey, how about you go to Mass with me? Hey, isn't God awesome? Hey, let me tell you about a miracle that happened to me. Raise your hand if you have a sense yourself personally or know someone close to you that's had a no kidding, for real, that was a miracle. Anyone in the room? Okay, let me make it easy for everybody. You were born. Raise your hand. Everybody raise your hand. Raise your hand. And keep your hand up. Everyone keep your hand up. And the reason I'm having you keep your hand, everybody raise your hand if you can. If you physically can raise your hand, raise it. Because I'm giving you an opportunity to have an act of faith. And I'd like you to keep it up. And we're going to keep our hands up actually for a few minutes, just to warn you, until we actually can feel our shoulders. And go like, wow, I have a shoulder. And if you need to use your other hand to hold that hand up, that's fine. But I invite you, you have free will, I invite you to raise your hand. And what you raise your hand for, how about this so I can maybe see if people want to raise their hand differently. Um, raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. How about I start with that? What are those, those hands look any different? Okay, so let me tell you I'm interpreting over here. This right here is, eh, maybe. We'll see what happens. We'll see what the devil has to offer. That's your choice. I mean, it's, this is not, this isn't rocket science. You're choosing Satan or God. 
So this is like, yeah, let's see what he's got. That's you, if this is where your hand's at. If this is your hand, this is a full vote. This is, I'm all in, Lord. And guess who's watching you right now? And it isn't Santa Claus. Well, he might actually. St. Nick might. I lived in Turkey for two years, and actually St. Nicholas is from Turkey. So I got to go visit his church, Bishop Nicholas. So if your hand's like this, you're like, yeah, I want to go to heaven. I'm all in. And why not? Why wouldn't you want to go to heaven? Why wouldn't you want to live forever with your loved ones? Why wouldn't you want to be at like a, the best wedding feast, the greatest Christian concert? You actually can sing and it sounds good and all that stuff. <laughs> Run and not grow weary. What, what part of this don't you want? It's weird for people in the world that don't have their hand up. And remember, we're going to do this for a little while. And you can use your other hand if you need to to lift your hand higher. You can put two hands if you want up. Because God sees us and sees our heart. And isn't it the first step that you want to go to heaven? Guess what the next step is? We act like it. We do what people that are on the road to heaven do. And that is we do what God asks us to do. Luke chapter 9, verse 2. Go proclaim the kingdom of God. Heal the sick and wounded and cast out evil. That's what he asks us to do. So if your hand's still up. And let me remind you, do you remember that story with Moses? Great battle and his buddies, his, his hands started getting tired and when his hands went down, what happened with that battle in front of him? His hands went down and God's people started losing and his friend, so maybe your friend next to you has been doing like weights, and they're like, I do shoulders every day. Help your neighbor keep their hand up. Help your neighbor get to heaven. Because this is an act of faith. Yeah, exactly. And you're feeling your shoulders right now. And this is good. Because guess what that's called, everybody? Sacrifice. So one, you have an act of faith. You're proclaiming that God is Lord, the creator of all. And when you remember the unborn, you remember that God created you in your mother's womb and God doesn't make junk. Everything God makes is good. And you are raising your hand, proclaiming your faith. And God sees that. You ready for more good news? Every miracle is preceded by an act, this is an act, of faith. So that means, go ahead and lower your hands down, that means that you have within you, for real, from your baptism and confirmation, the real power to do what God asks you to do. To proclaim the kingdom of God. You wearing that sticker? is proclaiming the kingdom of God. To heal the wounded. Woo. Who in here has ever literally done what God asks all of us to do? If you don't think, you're like, hey, that was the apostle. Oh, time out. Go take a look at Scripture again. Did you forget about the 72? Did you forget about the multitudes? Yep, and Jesus said the same thing to them, to the multitudes. Go forth, proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick and wounded. Why am I talking about healing the sick and wounded with a talk about abortion? If we have over 63 million babies that have been aborted, and mothers wounded, and families torn apart, do you think there's a need for healing ministry after this is all over? Here's the answer if you want to nod your head with me. Just do this. I'm giving you the answer on the test. Huge healing ministry. So are you ready? Are you ready? Like last night, are you ready when the lady at her encounter school of ministry said, I need prayer? And we said, what do you need prayer for? And she said, I aborted one of my children 36 years ago. And I haven't told anyone that. And I need prayer. Do you think that lady needs healing, ma'am? Darn tootin' if you would have been there. And do you think when we laid our hands on her and prayed in the name of Jesus to bind and rebuke any spirit of unworthiness, any spirit of doubt, 
that she is a child of God, fully redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus really meant it. And cast that junk straight to the foot of the cross. Do you think she looked different? She sure did. She went from someone that looked like they were dying to somebody that looked like they were living. John chapter 10, verse 10. God came to give us life and life, Father, what? Not just life, but life abundantly. The Word of God. So you ready? You ready to use your healing hand? You ready? So now I ask the question, who's ever put their hand on a family member or friend and prayed over them for healing? Has anyone ever done that in here? Just looking for a testimony. Bernadette, you have? You've done it? What's your name? Emerson, you've done it? What's your name? Shelby. Shelby. So there's people that have done it. Back there, you've done that? Awesome. Let's first homework assignment. Sorry, we're still at school. Today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. By Monday, homework assignment. Somebody that you know is hurt, sprained ankle, sprained knee, hurt feelings, sad about something. Their parents were divorced. They're sad. The homework assignment is you offer, can I pray over you for healing from what happened in your family, from the loss of your, anyone lost a brother or sister in the room? Lost a brother or sister? Car accident, something? Born Born too soon. Okay, so a little baby. Anyone else lost a loved one? Lost a brother, sister? What happened? Car accident. Has anyone ever... Put a hand over you in healing? Yeah. Praise God. And look at you. You're alive. Praise God, because a God is a faithful. Yeah. We know what Jesus did. We got to, there we go. I love it. You have a real Catholic school. Would you believe there's Catholic schools we speak in? Don't have a crucifix in the gym. Like of all the places, people of God, to have a crucifix, how about the place where visitors come for a sporting event? Does this seem like an obvious place to have a crucifix? Do you remember what St. Paul said? That was his feast day yesterday. St. Paul said, preach Christ and preach Christ crucified. Why? Because we can unite our pain, loss, to God's. He understands. What's your brother's name? Derek. Derek. In the name of Jesus, with the communion of saints and your brother Derek, We are hope-filled that you will live forward in abundant life, looking forward to spending eternity with your brother. Amen? Amen. Homework assignment. Pray over someone who's hurting, physically, emotionally, spiritually, before school on Monday. Teachers, why not? Hey, everybody, just want to see who... Check on the homework. Give them an extension if they need. Remind. Because then we're really doing it. Oh, speaking of really doing it. Really doing what? How about really doing what God asks us to do? Oh, you mean like pick up your cross and follow me? Hey. Anyone willing to put a four-ounce t-shirt cross on? Anyone willing to wear a t-shirt that has a cross on it? Raise your hand if you're willing to do that part of what God asks. Raise your hand. You willing to wear a cross on you? I'm I'm looking for people to have their hand down so I know who the spies are. Or who to go over to offer prayer to cast out some demons. Is everyone willing to wear a cross on them? That's what Jesus asked. What else did Jesus say? Thank you, put your hands down. Matthew 25, 40, what you do for my least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. Who's willing to stand up for the least of our brothers and sisters? Anyone willing to do that? Raise your hand. You willing to do that? Well, how about this least? brother or sister, the unborn. Can you think of anyone more least than a little baby in the womb? Me neither. So who believes that the Holy Spirit is real? Raise your hand. Anyone believe that? Is that part of your faith? Darn tootin' it's part of our faith. You put your hand down. Jesus said, I leave you a helper. 
And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll go forth and proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the wounded, deliver people from evil. For real. And that dove on the front is to remind us, to remind us that we have real power in us. Anyone willing to wear a shirt that looks like this? Anyone? Great. Because everyone's going to have the opportunity. Your community is going to get you a free shirt to be able to put on the first Wednesday of the month to remind you what it means to follow Jesus. And when you see Remember the Unborn, you're going to be reminded that God created you in your mother's womb. You're going to remember that. you remember that God is good. You're going to remember that nearly 64 million children have been dismembered in their mother's wombs. And you're going to remember those kids. And then you're going to know now that 78% of mothers that went into abortion facilities, 78% reported that if just one person or one per person encouraging them or an encouraging sign, they had seen an encouraging sign, a billboard, a bumper sticker, this shirt on someone's back in a grocery store, that they would not have aborted their child. All they needed was just a little bit of encouragement because that's what Christians do. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Be strong. Be encouraged. Be not afraid. For the Lord our God goes with us wherever we go. Amen? Amen. This is why we're at a Catholic school. Because we desire to follow Jesus. We want to go to heaven. And it's never been easier to be a Christian with the darkness around us. Remember, one light, one candle, one person in a shirt like this pierces the darkness. You know, you might go, oh, it's never been harder to be a Christian. A lot of ways it's never been easier. It, I'm not saying it's easy to be a Christian. It's not. Matter of fact, it's impossible to be a Christian without God's grace. There's no way you, just you, can do what God asked you to do. You don't have the capability. You need God's grace. You need His mercy. You need His forgiveness. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to heal people. God's going to heal people through you. Amen? Who's in? We still in? It's interesting. You go give like an eighth grade confirmation retreat and you tell them what confirmation is and you look at them. It's like, you still in? <laughs> you know? Good. Because it's worth it. Timothy, his feast day is today. He died 30 years after St. Paul. St. Paul's feast day was yesterday. He was stoned to death. Died for his faith. Outside that door... On my way in, I took a picture. Just on the way into the gym, just when I came in. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, if you haven't noticed it lately. Right when you walk in that door. Like, really? Yeah, just above the door. I was like, really? I have competed well. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. If that's you, at the end of your life, you're going to heaven forever at the banquet feast. Oh, and what about that banquet feast? Who was at that wedding feast at Cana? Jesus' mom was there. Anyone remember what she said to the servants? These are her last recorded words in the Bible. John chapter 2, verse 5. What did Mary say to the servants? Five words. Do whatever he tells you. Let's put one finger in the air. Like this. And repeat after me. Do. Do. Whatever. whatever. He. he. Tells. tells. You. you. 
Let's do it again with a little enthusiasm. Actually, Scripture says if you want to go to heaven, you should earnestly desire it. What does that look like? What would it look like if we earnestly desired heaven? What does that look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. It's zealful. It's enthusiastic. One other word for those who think religion's boring and being a Christian's boring, it's exciting. Repeat after me. Do, Do. Whatever. whatever he, he tells, tells you. you. Give your neighbor a high five if their hands up. So what sorts of things do you do when you're following God? One, you listen to His voice. Bernadette, could you come up here please? You listen to His voice. I mean, if you're just making decisions on I think so or how about this, those that follow God listen to His voice. Those that follow God actually like, hey God, what do you think? You ask Him. Ask God. And so for us, this flag we have in our hand is the same flag you see in the picture over our shoulder. And that picture over our shoulder was taken in July, July 13th, at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. You ever heard of Mount Kilimanjaro? The highest freestanding mountain in the world. It's in Africa. It's on the border of Kenya and Tanzania. God said, shout it from the mountaintops. We had an opportunity to do that. It sounded kind of like this. Holy Christ. Poor world. That was shouting at 19,000 feet. Who's seen Pikes Peak in Colorado? Raise your hand. Who's driven up it? Raise your hand. Anybody walk up it? Raise your hand. Anyone run up it? Yeah, I ran up it in 2006. And I had an encounter with a saint by the name of Padre Pio. Anyone ever heard of Padre Pio? Yeah, the only priest with the stigmata. He could bilocate. He could discern your soul. Mystical. Incredibly tapped into the Holy Spirit. And that was the beginning of Life Runners. That encounter with St. Padre Pio got my attention and had me listening a little bit more of what God had in store for my mission. Everyone here has a mission from God. Everyone, ask God what it is. And there's some things that all of us are on mission for. Like when people say, like, hey, Pat, that pro-life thing, you know, it's kind of your thing. It's everybody's thing. What you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for our Lord everyone's thing to speak up for the least of our brothers and sisters. All of us. It's all part of our mission. And so we were invited by Bishop Joe Coffey to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and to put this flag at the top. Bishop Coffey is the bishop for the military archdiocese. And when Bishop Coffey asked us on a Zoom call, because he's on the board for Life Runners, it, we, I said, yeah, we'll think about it. He said, yeah, you know, it'll bring you closer to God. It'll stretch you. And Bernadette right I said, okay. Burns like, I'm in. Um, My thought was, I've run up Pikes Peak four times. 14,000 feet was enough for me. No thanks. But then I asked God. And clearly God wanted me to join them on that journey. And you can see behind us this photo. Bernard, it's on your left. I'm in the middle. Bishop Joe's on the right. And the lady kneeling down is the co-leader of the second largest pro-life event in the world, the Walk for Life San Francisco. And last year, Bernadette and I had that banner in San Francisco. We were the only organization, Life Runners, that didn't cancel going to the San Francisco Walk for Life. And they told us if we weren't coming, they would have canceled the event. But we pressed forward. And there are speakers for the Life Runners Banquet March 25th in Omaha. So we're like, oh, I'd like to go hear them speak. Yeah, bold Catholic ladies. 
And that banner we had walking in the streets of D.C. with 150,000 people, like I said. And this banner was at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. I've got holy cards, like this image, on the table up there. When you get ready to leave today, if you want one of the holy cards, they were in our backpacks. You want a very high holy card, grab a holy card of this image. But Bernadette's going to share a little bit about what that was like. Carrying this message at the top of a mountain. And then I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to ask some questions about anything surrounding the issue of the unjust peace surrounding the law of the land. That in our country we can end the life of a baby in the womb through all 40 weeks. That's illegal at the federal level. And some states do that. Maryland, Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, Virginia, and many others. That at the state level, they legally abort children through 40 weeks. So Bernadette, share a little bit about that journey up that mountain. And then we'll take a few questions, and then we'll get to the finish line. That's right, Gilman's Point. I think that was about 17,000 feet. And then, um, and then it's all icebergs and stuff. So we're going through just this really little path, and there's a wall iceberg beside us on this end, and then a shorter on the other end. And um, this is the only reason I would go back, is because like, <laughs> during that, about me and I started praying for everyone else 
And so I'm walking through this iceberg and I'm praying for this woman's daughter for her conversion. And um, as I'm praying, and some of it, as I've shared with other people, like some of it, part of it was altitude that you feel heavier and things like that. Um, you feel like I felt terrible. I had very bad altitude sickness. But some of it, like this happens in my prayer life. So, like, like, the more you talk to God and the more close you stay with him, like, the more time, adoration is just incredible. Like, you don't have to do anything. You just sit in the Lord's presence, and he'll just start bringing you closer and closer and closer to him. And so you start hearing him deeper and, like, um, experiencing these things in prayer like I did on this mountain. So I'm walking through, and I just keep falling, and I keep okay, I'm going to get back up, I'm going to get back up. And so um, this one particular, I was praying for the conversion of this um, mother's daughter, and um, and I hit the iceberg on this side and then fell really hard on the other side. And as I did, I was, it was like I was holding Jesus' cross, and Jesus was with me. It was like I was under his arm and fell with him. And I had this sudden knowledge drop into my mind, like, this girl is going to be okay. Like, she is going to have a conversion. And so the next week, um, I ran into that woman's mother at, in Napa, California at the bishop's conference. And, um, and the mother just bawled. And the mother's friend said, um, when Julie's ready, have her tell you the story of what happened to her daughter last week. The timing even lined up. Yeah. So like that, God is that concise. Um, and yeah, just always remember the things that we do are not always going to be easy, but um, but we're called to do that. Amen. How about a round of applause for Bernadette making up Tony Carroll? And Bert, I don't know if you had mentioned, but it was her first mountain hike. So imagine her first mountain she climbed. And she told the, the porters, our guides, that came up in conversation. And I remember the guide was like, really? She's like, yeah, this is my first mountain hike. <laughs> Just, huh? He didn't tell until afterwards. It was on the way down? Oh, yeah, I wouldn't have let you finish if I would have known that. So, praise God. Questions. So, questions about all things. Life runners, the insights from the ologies, the perspectives, maybe something I didn't mention, but you're like, hey, I wonder what that guy, how he'd answer this. Do you have a hard question? Are you willing to, you know, ask a hard question? Anything that was said? Yes, Father. Okay, that's a hard question. Kind of. The question was, what about rape? So I said, it's a hard question. And then I say, kind of. And I think you'll see what I mean when I answer this. So this question of pro-life laws that have exceptions. A lot of pro-life laws would be, um, we've outlawed abortion except for circumstances of incest and rape. And rape is a horrible thing. Incest is a horrible, horribly evil thing. But lean in, everybody. Lean in. Guess what? It's not the most horrible thing. Let me go ahead and share with you what the most horrible thing is. That a mother would be duped, lied to, deceived into making the choice to have somebody else reach inside her womb and dismember her child. And remember, when they do an abortion, they pull the baby out by pieces. They put those pieces in a pan and they patch that little baby back together so they know they got all the baby's pieces. Head, arm, hand. That is the most horrible thing that can happen to a mother. So explain to me, like, here's the perspective then, Father. Explain then, everyone, how someone who's been raped, the second worst thing that could happen to a woman, doing the worst thing 
encouraging her to do something even worse. Explain to me how that is going to make the rape better. That is putting gasoline on a fire, on a womb. That is putting salt in the That is tearing the wound open. Oh, oh, let's go the other way now. Is it possible that a mother that's had a hor- woman that's had a horrible thing happen to her, rape or incest, that chooses something good to save the life of her child? It's not the child's fault what circumstances they were conceived in. There was a lady that spoke at the March for Life. She leads a ministry called Save the One. Bernadette prayed over her. And her ministry basically is, I was conceived in rape. My mom would have aborted me, but it was illegal pre-1973. And I'm so glad it was illegal because I'm alive. So a face on what I'm sharing. And she's like, and I'm so glad I'm alive. Even though I was conceived in rape. So can you step with me that when a mother who's had a horrible thing, rape or incest, chooses life something good, and even if she can't, like, oh, it's too emotional to raise that child, but allow someone else who can't have children raise the child, can you figure that that would be healing? That something good came out of something horrible? Does that make sense? That's my answer to your question, Father. Not bad, huh? Yeah, for, it's good. And so perspective, I already said early in the presentation that we're on pace for 850,000 abortions this year. But guess what? Guess how many adoptions we're on pace for this year? 18,000. Is your mind just like with cognitive dissonance blowing up right now? I'll do it again. 18,000 adoptions. 850,000 abortions. Oh, there's more. And of the adoptions, there's a two-year line to adopt a baby. You wait in line two years. So people are always like, well, what's going to happen if there's an abortion? There are people waiting in line to be able to parent a child. Perspective. Great question. Thank you, Father. Another question. Ask a good one. This is your shot. This is what I do for a living. Okay, so this is interesting. I commanded an Air Force clinic at Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City. Anyone been to Rapid City? Rapid City, anyone? The Black Hills, Mount Rushmore. There we go. And I asked my medical staff, Is there any medical situation that puts the the life of the mother today in modern medicine against the life of the child? And they gave me two scenarios. One scenario is an ectopic pregnancy. The baby starts growing like in the fallopian tube. But even that, that little baby, we studied it, that 70% of the time, the body naturally dissolves that baby. It's a non-issue. In the time that it is an issue, a lot of people that struggle where it could be, could affect through hemorrhaging the life of the mother, a lot of pro-lifers and ethics and whatnot will say, we're still not going to kill that baby, we're just going to remove the baby from the fallopian tube and allow the baby to die but not dismember it. So there's one challenging scenario. What did Bernadette Costello say? Her, she's in the camp of allow creation to move. And it's very few opportunity, few chances that really, really the mother's life at risk. That's scenario one they gave me. Scenario two. Someone's pregnant and diagnosed with cancer. And that mother has a decision. I have cancer, I can forgo treatment, and it could cost my life as the cancer spreads. Or I could take on treatment and realize I could hurt the child. Or I could abort the baby. Again, you have to say, is 
Is the mother better off for aborting the baby? You can see the ethics struggle there. Those are the only two modern medicine struggles. All the other scenarios, treatable. Does that lean into answering your question? Very few scenarios where someone would go like, oh, abortion to save the life of the mother. Other who has another really good hard question. Ask the hard ones. If you're like, oh, what would you have to say about this? Okay. Well, I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this. You are going to be afforded the opportunity to be real heroes. For real. That was the 78% stat. You stroll into soccer practice, baseball practice, going to a movie, going to the grocery store. For real, someone could see your message. And according to those post-abortion ladies, 78% said, this little bit about of encouragement would have prevented them from aborting their child. You're going to have an opportunity to get one of these shirts in the coming days and weeks and to wear it at school on the first Wednesday of the month in unity with nearly 18,000 life runners around the world in 2,178 cities across 41 nations. How Catholic universal is that as a body of Christ to stand up for the least of the least? Bernadette, did you have a... Yes. So Bernadette wanted me to sneak one more perspective for this age group because this is upon you. And I'll tell it in a story. There was a young couple in Columbia, Missouri. And this story was relayed to me from the Pregnancy Help Center director that went to a Pregnancy Help Center in Jefferson City, Missouri. Saw their unborn baby ultrasound and still decided that they were going to go have an abortion, saw their baby, this couple. It's a crisis pregnancy. They weren't married. And so they drove across the state of Missouri together, got to the Overland Park, Kansas Planned Parenthood. They're sitting in the waiting room, getting ready to go in to abort their child. And he sent her a text message. Remember, they'd just driven across the state of Missouri. Sent her a text message that said, I don't want to abort our child. She sent a text message back that said, I never did want to. Now, where's the lesson in the story I just told? He never said anything regarding the abortion. He never told her, I'll help you. We're going to be okay. Don't abort our child. He said that literally moments for the abortion saved the baby's life. But the point Bernadette wanted me to share with you is from a woman in a crisis pregnancy, silence is consent. So if you know of someone that's in a potential crisis pregnancy, the right answer is not, oh, it's none of my business and who am I to say and moral relativism, you're okay, I'm okay. Hey, whatever standards you decide. No, we follow Jesus. We follow his standards. We follow his law. And Jesus encouraged us to reach out and love to one another. If we're driving towards a cliff about to go up, well, who am I to say how he should drive his car? I know he's heading towards a cliff, but mm, his car, he should have checked a map. No! You're going to wave your arms out of love. There's a cliff. That's abortion. And so oftentimes all it is is that you would just... Vote, just bless, just the smallest amount of encouragement and a little baby will be saved and a mom will be spared a lifetime of heartache. When an abortion enters into a relationship, married or unmarried, 90% of those relationships end. How's that for a stat? It's destructive. Thank you, Bernadette, for teeing that up. Any other going once, going twice question for me? Because we're going to close in prayer. So you're going to have an opportunity to, to bear witness. One more time for an act of faith. Who's willing to wear their four-ounce cross 
follow Christ to speak up for the least of our brothers and sisters. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> You're going to get a chance to get really loud in a moment, just by the way. So everyone's like, oh, it's about ready to go. <sighs> going to practice pretty soon. You're going to have a chance to get really loud here at the end. Okay. This is the Life Runner's Creed. This is on the back of that holy card. And I said, if you want one, you can grab one on your way out, sitting on the table. We used to pass them out, and I thought, uh-uh. If you want it, you want to choose Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to walk up there and choose Jesus, his mom, our faith. I'm going, to, I'm going to allow you that walk to put your faith in action. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in the dignity of all human life from conception to natural death. We run as a prayer to defend children in the womb so they may be born and united with our Christian community. We run to build endurance, for the race is long and we must keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. We run for awareness, so our culture will view all human life as a reflection of your glory, Lord. We run for charity, to provide support for mothers and fathers tempted to abort their child, in healing support for post-abortion women men and families we run to end abortion for christ died so that all may live guard us all born and unborn with your peace lord for in you life is victorious we pray and run in your name jesus christ amen our lady guadalupe saint padre pio pray for us in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen okay here comes the loud stuff um, everybody stand up. Here, come on up here. You're going to demo with me. Yeah, come on over. What's your name? Philip. Yeah, we got a handshake. We're a team. We do everything in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, turn to your neighbor. We do everything in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we got a handshake. We got a jersey. That's the shirt. We got a handshake, and we got a cheer. And be loud. Be louder than the kindergartners. And they were pretty loud. Show your earnestly desiring to go to heaven and your zealous love for God. I'm going to give an all in Christ. You all give a for pro-life. Here we go. All in Christ! For pro-life! All in Christ! For pro-life! All in Christ! For pro-life! Awesome. God bless you, life runners.